Well, good morning. I invite you to turn in your Bibles, Bibles with me to the book of Acts, chapter 16. We'll be reading verses 6 through 15. It can be found on page 1176 of the Pew Bibles provided. We're picking up in Paul's second missionary journey in what is typically called the Macedonian call, where Paul is called down to Philippi, and there we witness his encounter with a woman named Lydia. So hear now the word of God. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and pray that you would bless us as we look to your word. We ask that your spirit would illumine our minds and renew our wills that we might understand your word and apply it in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if God is in control of everything, can Christians sit back and not bother to evangelize? Or does active evangelism imply that God is not really sovereign at all? These are the questions that J.I. Packer attempts to answer in his classic 1961 book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. But far from being outdated questions of the past, these questions continue to be relevant in American evangelicalism today. There are many who believe that a high view of the sovereignty of God makes evangelism pointless unnecessary. And though we as good Reformed Christians might not necessarily outwardly agree with such sentiments, isn't it true that sometimes our evangelism can grow a little cold and dull as we remind ourselves, well, well God is sovereign and, and he's going to save his elect. And so over time, our, our faithful and fervent evangelism begins to dwindle a little bit. And that's why we need books like Packer's book, because they remind us that the sovereignty of God is not a hindrance to evangelism, but the very fuel for it. What Packer does so well in his book is that he shows how the Bible holds forth simultaneously both the supreme sovereignty of God and man's need to evangelize. And in our passage today, we have one such example. Amidst a passage that is gushing forth with the sovereignty of God, nonetheless, we see Paul going out faithfully in evangelism. This passage is certainly no excuse for you to sit back and let God take care of everything. Rather, the clear call of this passage is this, knowing God is sovereign, be faithful in evangelism. And together, we're going to look at three demonstrations of the sovereignty of God that ought to serve as encouragements to you to be faithful in evangelism. Well, first, be faithful in evangelism, knowing that God sovereignly presides over your plans. Look with me at verse 
6. We read that they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. This is a group. It probably includes Paul, Timothy, and Silas. But notice the reason they went through this region. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now you'll notice very similar language in verse 7. They attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Now, I think it's best not to spend too much time speculating about how exactly the Spirit intervened in these two instances. The text simply doesn't give us that information. What is important is what the Spirit is doing. And here we have two examples of the Spirit sovereignly intervening to forbid, to prevent Paul from going into certain areas. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's not like Paul had bad motives. Verse 6 makes it clear that he wanted to speak the word in Asia. He wanted to go preach the gospel. And yet the Spirit said, no, not there. But notice this. The Spirit doesn't just forbid Paul from going into certain areas. The Spirit also leads and directs Paul to where he wants him to go. In verse 9, we read that Paul had a vision in the night. It was a man of Macedonia who, who called to Paul to, to come and provide help in Macedonia. And in verse 10, we read that immediately they sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called them to preach the gospel there. Do you see what happened? The Spirit didn't just say, no, you can't go here. The Spirit said, instead, go here. And so as Paul and his missionary team follow the leading of the Spirit, they set out from Troas in verse 11, and they eventually find themselves in Philippi. You see, God was sovereignly presiding over Paul's plans. Without the Spirit's direction, Paul would have never ended up in Philippi. He may have been in Asia, maybe even Bithynia, but not in Philippi. And this encounter with Lydia would have never happened. But God knew where he wanted Paul to be, and he led him to that place. Now, it's, it's true that you are probably not going to have a vision or dream in the night in which the Spirit leads you somewhere. But God is still sovereignly presiding over your plans today. How does he do so? Well, preeminently, God speaks to you in his word. And it is in his word that you can find direction and guidance for your lives. At other times, God providentially orders external circumstances. Sometimes God opens doors and sometimes God closes doors. There are certain geographic and cultural and political factors that may indicate to you where God is leading you. So, so don't be mistaken. Although the means of doing so may be different, God is still sovereignly presiding over your plans today. And what an encouragement this should be for us you see, if God wasn't sovereign, then you'd be forced to trust and rely on your own plans. You'd have to figure out everything on your own. And we all know how well that would work out, don't we? Do you remember Gamaliel in Acts 5, who said that if a, a plan is of man, of human origin, that it would fail? And when our evangelistic plans are of human origin, of man, they too will fail. But God sovereignly presides over our plans. He leads us where we need to be. And therefore, we can know that nothing will, will stop us. So therefore, be faithful in evangelism. So we've seen so far that Paul, that God was sovereign over Paul's plans and, and led him to Philippi. But but getting to Philippi is really only the first step. You see, God didn't send Paul to Philippi so that he could sample some of the local cuisine or take a bus tour of the city. He led him there so that he could evangelize the lost. And what do you need to evangelize? Well, you need people. And even more importantly, you need people who are willing and ready to hear you. And that brings us to the second encouragement. Be faithful in evangelism, knowing God sovereignly prepares people to hear you. In this passage, it is Lydia whom God is preparing. I want you to notice a few details about Lydia. She's an interesting character. Look at verse 14. First, notice that she is from Thyatira. Uh, 
Now, why is this important? Well, because this story is taking place in Philippi, and Thyatira is not exactly right down the street from Philippi. It's up in Asia. And so Lydia, she could have been in any number of places. She could have been back home in Thyatira, or she could have been in Corinth or Athens or Iconium selling her purple goods, as was her custom. But she wasn't, was she? She was in Philippi. Now, now, Lydia probably had no idea that she would have an encounter with Jesus Christ at Philippi, but God knew. And that's why he had brought her to Philippi, because he was sovereignly, providentially preparing her to hear Paul's gospel presentation. Also notice that Lydia is a devout woman. Verse 13 says it's the Sabbath day, and where is Lydia at? Well, she decided to gather with a group of women by the riverside for prayer. In verse 14, she's described as a worshiper of, a God, a worshiper of God. It's a phrase that often refers to a Gentile convert to Judaism. And so while she had not yet believed in Jesus Christ, she recognized her need to worship God, and she gathered with God's people to pray. What could be a better preparation for her, her to, to see her need for Jesus Christ and believe in him. You see, this wasn't a coincidence. God was intentionally preparing Lydia to hear Paul's message. And friends, know this, God works similarly today. Many of you can probably look back on your own conversions and recognize that long before you actually came to faith in Christ, that God was sovereignly working in your life to prepare you to hear the gospel. Maybe he brought somebody influential into your life. Maybe he brought you to a different city or country. Maybe something tragic happened in your life. Maybe it was something else. But God was sovereignly working on you to prepare you to positively respond to the gospel, to confess your need for Christ and trust in him for salvation. And God does the same for others all around us. And again, this should be a great encouragement Because you see, apart from the sovereign grace of God, nobody is going to be ready to hear you. We know that the cross, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. The last thing anybody's going to do is give consideration to your message. So if God isn't sovereign, you might as well just give up. But God is sovereign, and he's preparing people all over the world to hear the gospel. He prepared Lydia to hear Paul, and he will prepare certain people to hear you. So be faithful in evangelism. Well, the one problem that that still remains is that even if people are ready to hear the gospel, sin runs so deep as to make these very people unable, incapable of responding to the gospel. Thankfully, God has not left us with the responsibility of causing people to positively respond to the gospel. And that brings us now to the third, final, and perhaps greatest encouragement. Be faithful in evangelism, knowing God sovereignly provides salvation. Look with me at the second half of verse 14. It's one of my favorite verses. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Now, I want you to notice the obvious here. Who opened Lydia's heart? Did Paul open her heart? Did Timothy open her heart? Did Lydia open her own heart? No, it was the Lord who opened her heart. This verse, it's describing effectual calling, the work of God's Spirit, whereby convincing us of our sin and misery, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ and renewing our wills, he doth persuade and enable us to embrace Christ freely offered to us in the gospel. See, God not only prepares people to hear the message of the gospel, he also convinces and enables them to embrace Christ by opening their hearts. 
It's a picture of Ezekiel 36, where God sovereignly removes that heart of stone and replaces it with a new heart of flesh. This is what happened to Lydia here. And it is something that only the Spirit of God can do and the Spirit of God alone. Now, to be sure, Paul wasn't inactive in this process, was he? He wasn't just sitting back in Jerusalem reading some theology textbook and saying, well, God's going to take care of everything. No, if Paul hadn't faithfully proclaimed the gospel to Lydia, she would have never come to faith. But if God wasn't sovereign over salvation, Paul would have had very little motivation to evangelize. He could have been entirely clear and convincing and cogent in his gospel presentation, but nobody's going to respond. People are dead, dry bones. They're like Lazarus. They are incapable of responding. So you take God's sovereignty out of the picture. There is little motivation at all to evangelize. But God is sovereign over salvation, and he has promised to use our bumbling gospel proclamations to supernaturally save sinners and open their hearts. Therefore, be faithful in evangelism. Well, at, at this point, it should be clear that God's sovereignty is not a deterrent to faithful evangelism, but a catalyst for it. And hopefully, you, you, you yourself have been encouraged to go out and be a light for Jesus Christ, knowing that God sovereignly presides over our plans. He sovereignly prepares people to hear you, and greatest of all, he sovereignly provides salvation. But if any of you have ever evangelized before, you might be thinking, well, this is all, all good and well, but the reality is that evangelism is not always as easy as it appears to be in this passage. Not everybody responds like Lydia. And, and, and you're right. You're right. Evangelism can sometimes be very, very difficult and you're not always going to see fruit. In fact, as we've looked through the book of Acts, we've seen that the proclamation of the gospel is often met with much antagonism. And so you might be tempted to be discouraged. You might even be tempted to think that if you're not seeing souls converted on a regular basis, that Christ isn't pleased with you. But I would remind you that this passage and the Bible as a whole does not call you to be a successful evangelist, but a faithful evangelist. And now this doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive for success, that we shouldn't endeavor with all of our might to see souls converted. We should certainly do so. But at the end of the day, you have no control over whom God is going to save. Salvation belongs to the Lord. J.I. Packer said once, He is the Almighty Lord who turns men's hearts and gives conversion in his own time. Our part is to be faithful in making the gospel known, sure that such labor will never be in vain. You see, our part is to be faithful. Yes, evangelism, it's going to be hard at times, and you're not always going to see fruit, but press on faithfully. Human souls are at stake, and the eternal destiny of men and women is on the line. Would you hold back Christ's greatest gift? Press on faithfully. And when things get tough, remember that God is sovereign. Remember that he is not aloof. Remember that he is at work even when you don't always see it. Remember that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them all that Jesus has commanded, and all the while remembering that he is with you always, even to the end of the ages. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the midst of a lost and dying world, we pray that you would enable us to be faithful evangelists for Jesus Christ. There are so, so many people without Jesus, and we ask that you would use us as instruments of mercy to reach these people with the good news of the gospel.
May we confidently proclaim your word with the knowledge that you will sovereignly work to turn the hearts of men and women toward yourself. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray.